life now, all right? somebody beside me, and then a guy across the aisle. And nobody had their overhead lights on, and I had my iPad, and I'm trying to read a script. And he turned his, um, his camera, the light that you guys just had on, which is really bright in a dark room, right? It's a flashlight. And he was trying to read uh, something, and he had it turned looking at the thing, but it was shining right in my eye and the guy beside me. And the guy beside me was too polite, and I'm like, Excuse me, sir, can you use your overhead, please, because that's shining right, and he did, and I felt bad because he didn't even turn the overhead on, and he just shut the whole thing off, and he sat like this the rest of the fight. And I felt, you know, I felt bad, and I was polite, I wasn't rude, I was just like, excuse me, sir, it's, it's really bright, and, and uh, we get off the plane, and we're meeting the, you know, the Fanex, uh, everybody that's meeting there you know, to, to get us to our hotels and everything, and he walks off before me, and they're like, hi! And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and here is this wonderful writer and you know, graphic designer and everything. And, and so I went up into him and I'm like, I really didn't mean to be mean. And he's like, actually, I'm writing a new show. We were just discussing you. And I'm like, well, there went that job. <laughs> how, long, how long was the flight? I mean, was it like from Hong Kong? You mean sit there like for 12 hours just like looking at him? No, it was only an hour and a half. And, um, <coughs> But it was just after the guy in front of me, because I'm, I'm originally Canadian, and I'm, so I'm kind of like, I follow the rules. And uh, the, the, uh, the guy in front of me, you know, it, was, it was past everybody, you know, the, the, the flight attendants making sure that everybody's seat was up and everything like that. And we're taxiing, we're about to take off, and the guy in front of me rolls his seat all the way back. Which is not, you're not supposed to do that until you're up in the air, right? I was like, And then two minutes later, I'm like, excuse me, sir. So, I'm a really nice person, but I was a bit of a brat. <laughs> Not possible. I, but I was following the rules. So, so we, before we go, we have lots of people want to ask questions, but I have a few questions just to get started off. I just want to know, is, is your, do your parents love the letter T? <laughs> do you know all my sister's names? Yes, I don't think they do. Can you tell everybody what your sister's names are then? Um, I have four, three sisters. My oldest sister is named Tammy, and it was after some song. I can't remember the name of it, but it's a beautiful song. Maybe Tammy? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think it's called Tammy. Um, but I, I, I don't remember like who sang it or whatever, but it was a beautiful song. And then Trina... Hmm? Is that who it was? Oh, okay. I will have to... <laughs> Tammy and the Bachelor by Debbie Reynolds. Okay. Yay! Thank you, guys. Um, and then Trina came along, and uh, Mom just saw the name in the newspaper, and she's like, well, that's a beautiful name, so I named her Trina. And then I came along a few years later, and I was supposed to be the last one. I was the only one planned, mind you, which I like to rub in my sister's faces. But, um, and, uh, and so they said, well, we have to name her a T name, so they named me Trisha. And then seven years later, oops, and... Um, so then they were gonna name her Trixie, and my, my aunt in Toronto said, well, that's a nickname for a lady of the night. <laughs> and so they named her Tara instead. So it's Tammy, Trina, Trisha, Tara. I think it's wonderful, I love it. It, it made for a lot of mom yelling at us going, Tat, 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 Tri, you! <laughs> I know your name starts with a T. Yeah, excellent. I'm sorry, so, also, I heard some very interesting trivia about you. I'm curious if this is true. I heard that you were discovered outside a movie theater when you were about 17, and that's how you got started into modeling. Is, is that correct? Is that a true story? Yes, I grew up in a, very, I grew up in a farm, a uh, very small rural farm area community in Alberta, Canada. 
And I was just going to, in grade 11, I was just going to the movie, the one room movie theater, uh, about an hour away from the farm, and seeing Sleeping with the Enemy with Julia Roberts, and I think Eric... Eric Roberts. Eric Roberts, too, right? Yeah. Aren't they cousins? Brother and sister. Brother and sister, actually. Brother and sister? Yeah. Uh-huh. Didn't they play Levin? Yeah. Anyway. I've never thought about that all the time. Anyway, it was Sleeping with the Enemy, and... Um, yeah, and so, yeah, I was discovered outside of a movie theater, and, and um, Kelly Strait uh, from Fort, he's now, uh, he has mode models in Calgary, still he lives in Calgary, but he scouted for Ford models in New York, and he sent photos of me, and a week later I was in New York with Ford models. That's amazing. I, I think it's amazing. I love it, the fact that when you said you're from Canada, one person clapped, and then he apologized immediately afterwards. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, I'm an American citizen as well. So. Very proud of my American citizenship as well. I've actually lived in the States longer than I lived in Canada. Um, lived here since 92, so um, I am a very proud American as well. Excellent. And uh, you grew up on a farm, and your parents, they still own that farm to this day. Is, is that correct? Yes. We'll see about grains and whatnot. Yeah, it was a grain farm. If you follow my Instagram, you can uh, look back. It's a little ways back now. I think I went in. It was my grandmother's burial, so it was um, beginning of Jan uh, June, July. And um, uh, you can see a little video of, of some of the stuff that I did on the farm and some of my land. I have 30 acres there that I plan to build a house at some point. Oh, that's amazing. All right, we have a lot of people want to ask questions, so let's go ahead and jump into some questions. Okay, so my question is about Battlestar, of course. You had so many different rules. I had six. I can think of eight off the top of my head. Was it ever hard to keep all of this straight and which character you were playing on that day? Um, good question. Uh, it wasn't really because by the time I started getting multiple copies, really like multiples of them, uh, my hair had all fallen out in chunks and they had to get a wig. So the first season, the miniseries first season and halfway through the second season, it was my own hair that was dyed every 10 days. And um, if, you, if you watch, and in between seasons I'd have to dye it back to do something else, a different type of role. Um, but by that, when Gina, in the Pegasus episodes, that's when it all fell out in chunks. So the, the six looking over Gina, that was laying on the ground, that was a wig for the first time. Um, and it, it, it actually looked a little fuller because my hair had started getting shorter and thinner and shorter and thinner because it, it kept breaking off. Um, but, so there was quite a bit of hair, there was like a two hour, three hour hair and makeup changeover in between. So it would give you time to kind of get out of one headspace and into the other. Um, funny story, the makeup artist once, when she was taking me out of, when we did the Gina episodes in Pegasus, she, we did the six looking over first, talking to Baltar. And then when she, they were taking my wig off and taking my makeup off and starting to put the bruising on and things like that, she said to me, and I'm starting to think about getting into the other character, and, and she just looked at me and she's like, you're transforming in my chair. And I said, well, partly to do with what you're making me look like, but also because I'm, I'm getting in the headspace, you know, I'm starting to do my part of the job. Um, so where I found it a little bit more difficult was maybe towards the end, the end, because I, I saw them all as individuals, you know, Natalie in the, night, in the fourth season really was trying to broker peace with the Cylons, so she was much more the kind of the political-minded one. Um, Gina was the the damaged one that, you know, uh, had, had, a, had a very bad view on humans and, and because of what had been done with her. Then there was Sonia, and I can't really remember what she did. She came along after Natalie and tried to continue her mission. Um, then there was Shelley Godfrey, who I loved from the first season, and we saw again in, in um, The Plan. Uh, I liked her because she had sunglasses on, and I wanted to make her a little more upright because I thought that was early on in the season, uh, season one, and I thought, he, we, at that point, we knew the, the Langerous number six, right? And I thought, well, if here's this woman coming in, trying to convince people, because nobody knew that there was Cylon, human-looking Cylons at that point. If she comes in and she's this, like, hmm, trying to get Adama to say, blame this guy, nobody's going to believe her. So I wanted her to be a little more studious, so she, her, her clothes were a little more buttoned up. We had glasses on, which also were a story point, because Adama finds them. And a little bit, but she walked quicker. You know, it was... Number six would be like this, right? Shelly Godfrey was like... 
you know? <laughs> and uh, so I really worked on physicality, and, but you see them as different people. Uh, where I had trouble was when there was multiple copies in the background and we don't really see. Like for instance, at, at the very end, when we're all working together to repair the Galactica and there's a whole bunch of sixes up on scaffolding, and, or in the downloaded episode where you see all the Cylons on Caprica and, and there'd be a bunch of sixes walking in the background. Those were all photo doubles. Unless you saw their face, then they'd have to place me in it. But if you just saw the back of their head, they'd try and find somebody that was similar shape and height and they'd have them you know, walk away or something. And those days were really hard for me because I'm, I'm a little bit of a um, control freak. Perfectionist. And, perfectionist. And I would really, you know, you know, to their credit, they come in, they're not given the script, they're not given the story, they don't know what's going on, they're just told to walk across the room and they're either in a pretty dress or they're, you know, so they think, oh, that, yeah, I'm supposed to be. And there was this one girl and I would just watch each of them. And I'd be like, I'd walk up to them and be like, no, that's not how you walk. You, you know, you're more of a warrior six, you're more of a military six, you're more of a, you're on a mission. And I had one girl, she had to walk all the way across the plaza. And she was walking like she was a model on a runway. And I had to go up to her like, you're, you're going from point A to point B. You're, you're going on a mission, you're not out for a leisurely stroll or you're not on a runway. So I would, those days were hard because I'm trying to do my own job, but I'm also like laser focused on all the, all the other, you know, and I would and I would say to the to the um, the people booking them, I'm like, no, unfortunately, this girl can't be used because she's clearly, clearly, clearly anorexic, and I don't want to put that. And she was kind of being focused, and I was like, I'm not, so I don't want to put that out there to maybe some young women that are watching the show. Um, and a, can we get her some help? But, um, so those were, those were harder on me because I was a little bit laser focused on all the other sexes. Great question. Go ahead. Hello. Um, so my question is, do you think the human race is ready to interact with aliens if they exist? <laughs> and this is going to be scientific. We want to know. <laughs> um, hard to believe that we're the only um, beings out there in that vast universe um, of solar systems and everything and I don't know I've never personally seen another alien um, and are they if there are are they more advanced than us um, or less advanced than us I think there would be a whole faction of people that would be very interested in trying to communicate with them, and then I think there'd be a faction of people that would be uh, scared and not wanting anything to do with it. So, I certainly am not of the educated mind in that field to really know, um, but my, my inclination is we're not the only ones out there. And if there is, unless they're hell heck bent on um, <laughs> destroying us, <laughs> Um, Why is it going to be heck bent? Heck bent. <laughs> you taught him. Heck bent on um, destroying us, then uh, yeah, let's, let's try and see what they know. Great. Excellent. I think the last humans we do that, we fear the unknown, right? We, we fear that and the change just makes us nervous, but then there are those few brave people out there who can embrace that, the, the, the diversity and like that. And I think it's wonderful. Go ahead. Good I'm also a Trisha, so. Oh. I wanted to know if, after filming Battlestar Galactica for so many years, I know that you are still uh, close friends with many of the people on the show, like Katie you go writing with, and I don't know what your relationship with Jamie Callis is like, but what was the most unexpected friendship that you still have from making that series? Well, just on Labor Day last Monday, I was at James Callis' house um, with his wife and his three kids, and Michael Trucco and his wife were there and Eddie, Edward James Olmos was there, and one of his sons, Miko, and his wife, Suzanne, and their two kids, and um, Bodie's always around, uh, hot dog. Uh, Katie's in Vancouver filming. We're, we're all incredibly, incredibly close. Um, Battlestar was my first series. I, I'd started acting a year before. I went from modeling to acting, and it was, 
it's such an amazing experience. I've had amazing experiences since, but I, you know, I, not only was this my first one, but it just was such, such an amazing, um, again, not only the writing and everything like that, but that aside, we became a family. And they are, I didn't know anyone when I moved to LA. And so, and a year later I got Battlestar and they just, they're my closest friends. I mean, Michael Trucco is, and his wife Sandra, I see them all the time. I see Katie all the time. I just talked to a text with her the other day. I mean, I don't see her right now because she's in Vancouver, but she's like, you're coming up here to visit, right? And um, so it's, it's hard to separate the show from my personal because of it, just because <clears throat> I don't see the Vancouver actors as often. Um, but we, we were all in uh, Germany last year, uh, FedCon or earlier this year. And there was a whole bunch of us there and a whole bunch of the, the Vancouver-based actors. So we got to see Grace again, um, who we haven't seen as much because she's been in Hawaii. Um, AJ, and I, you know, um, I think there's a picture on my Instagram of me hugging AJ. I hadn't seen him for years and just the pure joy on our faces. And, um, and Tomo, and it's just, I'm a really lucky, lucky lady to have, have friends like that. Because they're, they're not just actors they've become my closest friends, and they're family, and they always will be. And you, you, you mentioned, because you were a model, and you transitioned into acting, and when you transitioned to Battlestar, you hadn't been acting that long, but the, the, they were so impressed with you, they used you pretty much almost, almost for all the promotional material, particularly in that red dress. Did that, did that cause a little bit of anxiety, thinking, oh, I am now the focal point of this, you know, because you, that's a transition. Was it a tough transition going, going from modeling to the acting, or do you just feel like, oh, I got this? Um, when I stopped modeling, I, I really, I think there's now a little bit more of a crossover, but at the time, I wanted to be taken seriously as an actor, and there was quite often a stigma, oh, models can't act, and, and there was also a stigma of like, oh, well, you look, well, not now, because I'm 44, but then, um, of, oh, you don't look like you could play this part or whatever, and, and granted, number six played into that, but, um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, clearly don't have a Cylon brain. <laughs> um, was it difficult? Oh, um, state the whole question. Because well, you, you moved right into being the Cylon, pretty much the center. Oh, I know what I was going to say. <laughs> Did my job. Um, about being kind of the marketing yes. image for it. And really the main reason, there's, there's two reasons for it, is number six was one of the main characters. So it wasn't like they took a character, you know, 30th down on the call sheet and made her the, you know, the, the marketing material in, in the beginning. You know, one of the main reasons was the style of the show was very dark and gritty and kind of documentary style, and and they're all in their 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 BDUs or their dress blues or something, and it's it's all very kind of gray and gritty. And then at at that time, Six was the only known Cylon, and here she's got this you know white hair and this red dress, and so she stuck out, right? And visually, for marketing campaigns, you, you need a visual aspect, right? But I think one of the main reasons also was because I came from a modeling background, actors, for some reason, hate gallery shoots. And gallery shoots are what we call when the studio and the network come in and they, do, they uh, reserve a day for, sometimes it's on a weekend, sometimes it's they try and fit it in during production, and all the lead cast are there and some of the recurring cast. And they design what they're going to be for, you know, one year we were, we were, well, you guys all know the Last Supper photo. That was a gallery image, right? A gallery shoot. And for some reason, actors, if they weren't models before, they're used to the still, they're used to the, the motion, right? So they feel completely comfortable having a conversation and having it be filmed. The second it's a still camera and you're just catching a split second of time, which granted, now with digital, you can pause it on any weird face, you know? <laughs> it's like, really? Did you have to pause it there? Um, but, but, you know, with, with, uh, with, with still cameras, it really is just a snippet of time. And for some reason, actors uh, generally 
just don't really feel very comfortable. And so you get everybody all together at once and you're trying to get them placed and whatever and then it's like hoarding a, back, a pack of children. Uh, I'm hoarding a pack of children and uh, you're trying to like, would you stop talking? Would you stand there? Would you stop turning around? Would you just stand? We'll get the pick. We'll get done faster if you... <laughs> and, and it's really like that. Everybody is chatting and not in their spot and me coming from modeling as a model, you have to have a ton of patience, and you're used to standing there having your photo taken. So I would just be standing there, part of my mind going, would you guys be quiet? <laughs> and, and so the photographer just kept taking pictures of me. And then they'd be off at the craft table or whatever, and I'd just still be kind of standing there, and he's like, well, you want to go on that back backdrop and do some more? Sure. So they had so much footage of me for the first for the miniseries in the first season that that's and then again mixed with the fact that you know you in the red dress dressed up as number six right there you stick out right now because I you know I can see you the red hair the white hair red dress and um, that's I think the main reason. I love that. Next question. I know the majority of your questions are going to be about rules, but. I'm a really avid fan of the StarCraft series, and I wanted to ask about your role as Kerrigan, you know, one of the most uh, amazing characters from that series, and I wanted to uh, get a view on uh, maybe what some of your more memorable experiences playing that role. Uh, StarCraft was a, a great experience for me. Um, I had done a couple of video games prior, and this was one where, especially towards the a lot of times when you're shooting video games, you have no reference. I personally don't play myself. I can barely figure out how to turn my TV on. And um, a complete tech idiot. Um, but you're not given a script. Like when you're, when you're given a, a, a TV script or a movie script, you can read it all and you can understand what's happening. With video games, you're not. You're generally not given anything until you show up that morning. Um, sometimes you'll give, like when I did a Web of Shadows Black Cat, they gave me some of my dialogue the night before. Sometimes when I did um, some other things, they would give you a little bit of dialogue the night before. Mass Effect is, was famous for, you don't know anything. You show up in the sound booth, the first time you read a line, it's on a computer screen in front of you and they're recording. And you're in there by yourself. You're not, you're not working off of another actor. It's not like Seth Green and I were sitting there in the room, like, working off each other. And, um, but with, with StarCraft, especially since I did three, they, they gave me stuff the night before so I could kind of familiarize myself with some words and names in video games are not the easiest to say. Um, there's one I just had trouble with all the time. I can't remember his name right now. It starts with a TH. Oh, Tychus, not Tychus, um, Anyway, I'll think of it. And um, he, so they, you know, it gives you a little bit more time to kind of familiarize yourself. You still don't necessarily know what's going on, but to me that one had the most story that I could follow. And then towards the end, after she had been, you know, she became the Zerg Queen and, and you know, the, the Queen of Swarm, or, yeah. And then, and then she got desergified because Rainer, you know, captured her, got her, and then she was basically being an experiment, and then she escaped, and then she ultimately decided that her mission in the world was she could no longer be with the man she loved because she had to go off and help, but she had to then become the queen a little bit more again. So that got a little bit like a mind meld situation because we would film all three at the same in the same session, and there were slightly differences with their voice if she was just the queen then she was a little more evil. And if she was Sarah Kerrigan, she wasn't. And then if she was, what did we call her? Uh, the, the, the queen afterwards, we called her something else. And so the voice director becomes very important and there's always writers in, in the other part of the sound booth as well because you're like, what's going on here? And they'll fill you in. Um, but that, that was really funny because I'm like, okay, am I, am I queen? Am I pro, uh, you know, Sarah, am I, who am I here? And uh, it would it would depend on how you then what you brought out with the voice. Um, but that I to me that's probably one of my favorite games just because I could understand 
the story more, and also the love story at the end. I, I know I'm talking a lot, but there's one there's one funny little story that uh, with Rainer. One time they brought us in to film a bunch of us all together. I think it was for the last game that I did, and it's where uh, Sarah Queen kisses Rainer, and I kind of looked at Andrea, the the voice director. And when we got to that take, um, Robert was right beside Robert, right? Yeah, he was right beside me. And when um, Sarah Queen's supposed to kiss him, and you have to stay on your mic. But I told them in the sound booth what I was going to do, so they amped up his mic a little bit. And I just walked over to him and I planted one on him. <laughs> and and then he had a line afterwards, and that's the take they used. Oh, yeah. Did he know? Did he know? He didn't know I was going to do it. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. <laughs> okay. Now you have you, your your body of work is so amazing. You've done almost you've modeled, you've done television, you've done movies, you've done video games, and you've also done like animation. They're all a little bit different. Do you have a preference for any one of those? I I really do like uh, on camera, but I I like doing them all. That's to be able to do them all is the most fun, um, but I do prefer being on camera, either TV or film, just because you get to work off the other actors. Uh, video game and animation uh, gets pretty isolating sometimes because you're in a sound booth by yourself. So while it's fun, and you can generally show up in your PJs if you want to, um, unless they're shooting B-roll, uh, which is, you probably know, behind the scenes stuff, uh, but with, I, I do like the interaction off the other actors sure. because it's, it's, you know, acting is really about listening and, and how a scene can change each take because of, you know, especially if you're playing with somebody that wants to play. If you're working with somebody that's maybe a little bit newer or just a little bit more, you know, um, they come in with what they're going to do and then it's hard to, you know, it may be great, but then it's hard to kind of alter and, and you know you do multiple takes for many reasons but it's really fun when you're working with an actor where you're listening to each other and then maybe they say something slightly different one way which will make you say something slightly different and you may it may not work and you fall flat on your face and you laugh about it and you make the blooper reel or or it's it's something unexpected and fantastic and it's what makes the cut awesome go ahead so I love you as Six in Battlestar Galactica, and you can probably guess from the hoodie, I absolutely adore you as Edie in Mass Effect, but that's two different sexy robot ladies. Do you worry about getting typecast? <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't. I think I, um, I don't really get too many romantic comedies. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm almost six feet tall, and, and, I, have, uh, <laughs> and I have a strong voice, and, and, and um, so I tend to not be the type that they take for, you know, romantic comedies or, or something. Uh, I sometimes have to fight for, to be to be seen differently, and um, I, I love playing a good robot role for sure. Um, but then, again, as an actor, you don't want to just do one thing. You know, um, it's. Because you want to be able to show all different facets of human life and human character and each time you bring a little bit of yourself into something or you release a little bit of yourself from something or you, or you get to uh, train and learn something, right? Um, because of the character that you're about to play. So I would never want to just get stuck doing one thing. Um, but yeah, great robot role, great I'll do it again, for sure. Go ahead. You were amazing in Battlestar Galactica. Um, what was it like to film the scenes when, um, with Baltar, when you were the only one he could see? How, what was that like? Um, you know, somebody asked me this at the table the other day, and it was definitely a learning curve for, less so for me, but more so for the other actors in the room. Baltar, of course, uh, probably learned the quickest because he and I had so much to do together, or James and I had so much to do together. But you could tell 
every time you had somebody new in the room that hadn't been in one of those type of scenes before, because it's, it's human nature if somebody's speaking that other people look, even if it's just a glance, but that ruins it, right? That ruins the, the cell if, you know, Rosalind's in the corner and number six says something and Rosalind goes right at six, right? So everybody got, they, they became brilliant at it. It was like I wasn't even there. Maybe gave me a little bit of... <laughs> um, now in therapy because of it. Um, no, but, and, but you could tell. So everybody became really, really, really great with, high, with have that, having that pregnant pause and figuring out they're doing something, you know. Um, you know, the actors on Battle Server were, were great, so they all figured out what worked for them to not be paying attention to when Baltar was acting erratically or doing something or I was talking, right? Um, you could tell when somebody knew, like when Richard Hatch came in, was it second season or third season? Something like that. When Richard Hatch came in, the first scene he had with us, with Baltar and I, he had so much trouble with it. And it had been a span of time between when we'd had somebody new come into the situation and types of those type of scenes. And he was just like, ah, oh, I don't, she's right here. And I think I was leaning on his shoulder and he's just, and he would forget his lines. And he's just, and he finally was just, I don't, I know my lines, like, but I don't, she's, she's right here and she's whispering in my ear and I don't, and, and we were all just laughing and we were like, calm down, don't worry about it, you'll get used to it, and he did. It's just a learning curve, right? But those scenes were also really technically difficult, and I know I'm being long-winded, I apologize. Just, you know, tell me to be quiet if I'm getting long-winded. But those scenes were also very technically hard to, to film because we did it, majority of the time, we did it real time in terms of, and, and they would do it in, they wanted to try and get away from as much editing as they could. So sometimes, yes, you have to edit where they'd have to cut and I would have to leave and then they'd do the scene without me and I'd say my lines from off camera and then they'd do the scene with me in it. Um, but then sometimes they're like, oh, there's set pieces, we can, and some of you may have seen this, I've done this at some panels before, or you may have seen it online, but a lot of the times, because it saves time, TV moves very fast. And so it saves time. If you have to cut, then you have to reslate, and actors are children, and so they'll like wander off to get a coffee and whatever. And it can sometimes take like 10 minutes to get back to shooting, right? So they'd say, okay, well, the camera's just, you're, you know, Baltar's sitting here, right? And you're, you're Baltar. Okay. Baltar's sitting here, and maybe some of the others are over there talking. And number six is like this, and she's like, you know, God is love. I remember my life. And, and, and all that kind of stuff. Or, or six is sitting on his lap or something, and they're like, okay, so the camera's on you, and they're just gonna slightly pan, slightly pan that way to get a reaction of something Baltar just said to, you know, maybe he was acting all like, like this. You gotta do that. Uh -oh. <laughs> and then Rosalind's over there looking at him like, what's he doing? That's a strange man. And, the se and I have to watch, and the second the camera panned, I'd have to... <laughs> and I'd be listening to the dialogue, and I'd be listening to the dialogue, and then they're talking, and then the camera would be, you know, and then all of a sudden I'd hear somebody else, and I'm like, oh, that's my cue to be back up there, and then I'd be... <laughs> what did I tell you? circle, they'd go around the room, you'd almost get dizzy because they'd keep going around the room in a circle. And I would have to be following the camera, and there's cords everywhere, and I'm in high heels and a dress, and there's a boom, boom man, you know, with a big pole and everything, and I'd have to be following behind, like, not getting hit, okay, he's backing up, I'm gonna get hit in the head, okay, and then, oh yeah, oh, they just panned over there, oh, now I'm back here. <sighs> And I'd be out of breath, and then I'd have to say my line, and, and so those were really difficult. Um, and they got kind of tiring at the end of the day. Well, that was a long-winded answer, sorry. What was, what was your name?
want to say thank you for asking that question. <laughs> I would like to say that in the hands of Richard, I, I can understand why you could forget your lines in that situation. I mean, very few. So, go ahead. Trisha, I'm a huge fan. Um, I'm wondering how it is to play goddess mother of life, mother to this woman and star. You know, it was, it was a straight offer. They they offered me the, the the role, and I hadn't seen. I had actually originally read for Chloe Decker, <coughs> um, but it was very last minute because I was on hold for a show called Ascension, and Sci-Fi had passed on it. Uh, so the next day, my team got me in for to read with Len Weisman and and strike because they were shooting like imminently and they didn't have Chloe Decker. And um, I went in that afternoon, learned my lines, went in that afternoon, did a great audition. Um, and then I left there, by the time I got home, I had a message saying they want to use your tape uh, as a test. It's just you and another girl. And I went, okay, great. And my agent being the good person that he is, uh, called up Lionsgate, who owned Ascension, the studio, and said she's going to test for this. And they said, no, 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 no. She's still under contract because we're going to shop the series. So I had to back out. So I had read, and it probably would have gone to Lauren anyway because she's brilliant in the role, but I had read, the point of that story was I had read the pilot, so I knew what it was about. And I thought, oh, it's, it's cute. I hadn't seen the rest of the series. Um, but I said, I'm in. And uh, it's, it's amazing to get a straight offer, but at the same time, then when you actually get to set, you're like, oh, but what if my take on it is not what they want, and am I gonna get fired, and blah, blah, blah. But they were a really great team, and Tom actually, Tom Ellis actually was a fan of Battlestar, so he was like, oh, number six is here, and he's playing, she's playing my mom. And, and uh, so it was a really, really, really lovely team, and, and my first, my first uh, scene was coming out of that elevator. And I was fine all going into it, you know, I thought about it, I'm like, I've played a robot before, I've played a Texas Ranger, I can do this. I didn't have a reference point, goddess of all creation. It's not like you're like, oh, I'm a cat person, I can play a tiger trainer, like, you know. And I, so it's, it's a lot of imagination, and it's about finding the right tone of the show. And so I went and, and I watched the rest of the first season and tried to figure out the tone of the show. And, and it really was about a mother that was wanting to see her sons, you know? So I like relate it back to, uh, you know, yes, celestial beings, but relate it back to just dysfunctional human drama that we all have, right? Um, they were children of divorce and there was misconceptions and she had had to lie to her son to kind of protect him and, and in his father's eyes and things like that. Again, it's based off a graphic novel, right? Um, so I was like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And then the elevator doors close and they yell rolling. And I'm like, <gasps> how do I play the goddess of all creation? <laughs> I don't quite know what I'm doing. And uh, you know, and then you just go from there. The doors open and you come out and, and um, but Tom is an amazing actor to work off of. And so we, we just had a great time. My first seat, seat, uh, my first episode, I have hair, hardly anything to do. It was the second episode coming up where that was one of my favorite episodes, um, where she's trying to explain and they go looking for this tiny spear screwdriver, and it was it was it was so much fun. And uh, one of the first takes in that first episode of Lucifer catching me as I come out of the elevator, he split his pants. So I was like, okay. I feel fine now. <laughs> Exit. We have time for one more question. Let's go quickly. Only one? <gasps> I talk too much. I'm sorry. No, you've been wonderful. <laughs> um, as someone who's watched Battlestar Galactica multiple times, I'm curious for you, what was the most satisfying scene or episode to film for you as an actor, as an artist? Oh, there were so many, and I'd probably be able to give a better answer to this soon because uh, last year I announced I was going to do a Battlestar Galacticast, a podcast on the rewatch of Battlestar Galactica, 
with Mark Bernardin. Um, do you know him from Fat Man on Batman? Batman on Fat Man. Um, and he's also a writer on Castle Rock. Wonderful guy. And funny side story, he was actually the journalist at Entertainment Weekly who was covering Battlestar Galactica during the run of it. So he knows the show inside and out. So we've actually taped a couple of episodes already. Uh, Katie Sackhoff was our first guest. And, uh, and, uh, and then we kind of got delayed a little bit because uh, now the distribution company that is going to distribute it, we just got caught up in corporate and we're trying to get contracts and all that kind of stuff. But it's about ready to announce. Um, we're so are these some of the very first people to hear about this, thing? this? Yes, I've mentioned it, but you guys are the very first people to hear about where it's going. I don't want to get in trouble and say where, but y'all all know where. It's not. It's very much related to Battlestar and companies that may have aired Battlestar. Um, but uh, you know, it, it took a little bit of a turn. But my point with that is, is I'm going to now rewatch the entire series of Battlestar Galactica 10, 15 years later after it's aired as a viewer. And I'm so excited because I will maybe be able to answer your question better as a viewer and being able to remind, remind, you know, be reminded of all the scenes in it. But just from a purely selfish standpoint and my memory going back, um, and I've said this before, so many of you have probably read it from me before, is for me it's probably the Pegasus episodes because <clears throat> it, it was the first time I've had Shelley Godfrey, I've had Caprica Six in the beginning, obviously in the miniseries, and then it, she evolves in, or we only see number six after that, head six. And then we saw Shelley Godfrey in one episode, which I loved playing Shelley Godfrey. But it wasn't until the Gina episodes where I got something a little bit more to sink my teeth into. And, um, you know, I wanted to, I was fascinated by the idea of this, this robot that was suffering from PTSD. And I wanted to bring some of that into it. And so I did, uh, you know, research on it and research of, of what happens in, in, in war times to either soldiers or, or maybe rape victims or something like that that are suffering from this type of thing. And she had had both situations, right? And, um, and so for me, it was just as an actor, I finally had enough, because I was getting a little sick of playing, I'm getting a little sick, getting a little tired of playing just head six. Because she didn't really have a storyline of her own, right? She was just how she related and she was giving information to Baltar and, and um, I was craving something more. And, and then the Pegasus and Gina came along. And so for me, that was a turning point um, and, and also a character that I fell really in love with um, because of her damage and, and ultimately, you know, ultimately she, she blew herself up. And, and uh, along with the, what ship was it? The fantasy ship, whatever, the... Cloud Nine. Cloud Nine, the fun ship, right? Um, yeah, but, you know, she did it to make a point, but there, that was probably one of my favorite. And then I also really liked Natalie at the end. Um, because I really, I, I believed in her mission, and at the point they were um, in their journey, both humans and Cylons, of really trying to see about working together, finding the happy middle ground. And that's me as a person. I really find many times that the middle ground and is the best way because you can try, and, you know, extremes on both sides are hard to come to a middle ground, but if you both, if, if both sides listen to the other, quite often you can find a middle ground that works for both. And um, that's what I thought Natalie was. I wish we had more time. I think I wish we had more time and you had to do that all of our scene one more time. That was amazing. But you guys give a huge round of applause.